So church, we take new steps in a new season on a new road. Scripture takes the time, before we get into this, Scripture takes the time to tell us that post-resurrection, Jesus saw it fit to spend time with his disciples risen for 40 days, where in that 40-day span taught them lessons about the kingdom. It, it's, a, it's a really weird window, but it's a powerful one. And I think it's interesting, church, as we turn the pages of the Scripture, how it is that we learn, even after the tomb, the Lord sets a table. And we walk really confusing roads. The disciples then had some reservations. We do too. Uh, we're, we're, we're not sure of what to make of our experiences. We're not sure of how to, to take a step forward as, as disciples who proclaim the Lord conquering hell, sin, and in the, in, in the grave in the midst of less than favorable things that we continue to experience. And, and, and so what I see following the resurrection of Jesus is that consistently, even after the tomb, the Lord sets a table, and significant things happen at those post-resurrection tables. The disciples then had some reservations, some uncertainties. We do too, but despite it, the Lord makes a practice of reserving us a space nonetheless, of saving us a spot. And, and so, for the sake of our, our clarity, it's kind of a play on words. I'm offering a short teaching series, a three-week span before we get into some other uh, teaching moving forward that I have entitled uh, Reservations, Reservations. Um, I want to bring you to a scripture passage this morning that I, that I think speaks to that. We canvass it in our children's moments, uh, but I want to bring you to the latter portions of the Gospel of Luke chapter 24, and it's a, con a continuation of where we were last week where there was some idle talk, there was some tales from the women that weren't tales um, they learned. Uh, those women encountered an empty tomb and some angelic messengers that said, not only is he not here, he is risen. And they left that place proclaiming that good news and some stuff manifested in between that I think are significant. And I want to spend some time there in this short series that I've called reservations. A space, a spot has been saved at the table. We have reservations, but at the same time, as, as a people who try to follow a risen Lord with the stuff or the obstacles that, we, that are challenging to us in between, we have some hesitations, some reservations. And so it is, I want to bring you to our text this morning. If you're able in body or in spirit to stand to receive the word, I invite you to do that. If you're online, a posture that is comfortable for you, a, a, a means of allowing you to be fully present. I trust that if you're watching this, you're not standing in your living room. But find a place where you can be fully present this morning. Chapter 24 in Luke, verse 13. Now on that same day, meaning that same Sunday morning, when they received the reports from the women... On that same day, two of them, two disciples of Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked, they were talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and he went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, Hey, what are you all discussing as you travel along? What are you discussing with each other while you walk? And, and so they stood still, most aghast in a way. They stood still looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Look, man, are, are, are you the only one? Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked them, well, What things? And so he had to go on and explain the narrative. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and were before God and all of the people, and, and how our chief priests and leaders, they handed him over to be crucified, condemned to death, and he died on that cross. But we had hoped. That's a powerful phrase there. We had hoped. We do too. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. 
Yes, and besides all of this, it's now the third day since these things took place. And moreover, some, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said he, he was alive. And some who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Isn't it funny how they were having a conversation to Jesus about Jesus in reference to people that didn't see Jesus? <laughs> Isn't it funny how the Lord could be so close and yet so concealed? Mm -hmm. So then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. And then he goes on to say this. Did you not know that the Messiah had to suffer these things? Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then, starting with Moses... And all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. Interesting. And so as they traveled, they came near the village to which they were heading. They weren't quite there. And he walked ahead, Jesus did, as if he were going on. But they urged him, despite the inconvenience, stay with us. Stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. And so he went in to stay with them. And, and when, at the, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to them. And it was at that point that their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And when they recognized him, he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, despite the reservations, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? And so that same hour, they didn't waste any time. That same hour, they got up and they returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he's appeared to Simon. And then they told him what had happened on the road, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. That's where we stop this morning, a living word of God for living people of God. And we say... Thanks be to God. In this reservation series, I want to offer this as a jumping point. Reservations for tomorrow. Reservations for tomorrow. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you for the receiving of this word. As we go into it, Lord, we pray that the word goes into us, that we might not only receive it with the, with the reservations we have for tomorrow, the anxieties and hesitations we have for the coming days. We ask that you be present with us at this table set so that we might be able to enflesh this word that we've received. Have your way, great God that you are. We thank you ahead of time for the movement of your Holy Spirit and the way that you meet us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. So, the scriptures shine the spotlight. The scriptures shine a spotlight on two disciples that find themselves in the tension of transition moving from one geographic location to another, one space to another, and not just one space, but one season, or one stage of life to another. They, they found themselves in the tension of being in between, and we can't sit here and not say that we've never experienced the tension of being in between. And there's lots of levels at which that was taking place, they, they were not in Jerusalem anymore where they had left the others, but yet they were, not, they were not yet in Emmaus. They were somewhere in between. Help me out. Uh, when, 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 it, when they were traveling, it wasn't early dawn like it was for the women who went to the tomb. It wasn't early dawn, but it wasn't at the dead of night either. They were somewhere, help me, in between. In between. Jesus, in this particular state, had been risen was conquered hell, sin, in the grave, and yet wasn't yet ascended to the Father. He was somewhere in between. They were between conversations. They were in the middle of a conversation when Jesus met them. And, and so they realized as they traveled, there was no longer two. There was a third party. And, and, but, but yet they were kept from recognizing that he was the one that they were talking about. These two were somewhere in between. 
Somebody, no, everybody in this room knows what it means to travel in the tension of some transition. Everybody knows the burden of being in between. In fact, if you're breathing, you're in between. Not just between breaths, but irrespective of your age or stage, your particular circumstance or situation, whether you're 15 or you're 50, you're in transition. You're in the middle of something. You're in between. All of us, at any age or stage, any circumstance, knows what it's like to be in the tension of being in between. And brothers and sisters, as Maya, Maya Angelou said, we are all in route. And, 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 to, and to use that phrase, to, to use it, since we're all in route now, we all have reservations about next. Every single one of us, six or 60, since we're all in route now, we all have reservations about what happens next. Especially when it turns out that your plans didn't turn out. When what you thought would happen didn't happen, or it hasn't happened yet. The great philosopher, Mike Tyson, The great philosopher Mike Tyson is known to say that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And these disciples weren't just punched, they were paralyzed because of what had happened that they didn't expect to happen. Did you hear the thrust or the complexion of their dialogue when Jesus met them? You know, some women told us some stories, some idle tales about him uh, b being risen. They had talked to some angelic messengers we're just convinced that his body had been removed and we're not gobble enough to stick around. It doesn't sound like two guys that were easily buying lines that would go back home to be able to trumpet a new religion to tell a lie that they didn't believe. No. They said, we had hoped. We had anticipated. We planned for him to be the one to redeem Israel, and yet we watched him stretch high and wide in between two criminals in between heaven and earth. And we knew that he gasped his last and said that it is finished. We watched his body be wrapped and placed behind a tomb, sealed. So all we needed to do was to go home. The Jesus experiment had expired. They were done. And despite the others hanging around in Jerusalem, they had no other, they had no other plans but just to go back home. They didn't know anything else to do but to head back home. Because when he died, their hope died with them. They knew what they had with him in the past. And, and, and they, 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 they knew where they were headed presently. But they had a heap of reservations for tomorrow. Because today, we had hoped that tomorrow would look different. But we don't know what to do for tomorrow. And all they knew to do was to head back home. And you might be saying, well, Pastor, add me to the list. Add me to the list, even post-resurrection, post-Easter celebration. Add me to the list of people or prospective disciples who have reservations too about what it means to move forward. Do you know last week we talked about what it means to get peace in something you couldn't get past? We talked about that, how the women had prepared spices and they walked a lonely, lo the lonely road to anoint a body that was behind a boulder that they couldn't budge. And trying to get past something that you can't find peace in, they were trying to do that. And maybe you're one who, to this day, is trying to get peace in something that you can't get past. And so as they traveled, they were commensurating with one another. They were having dialogue. And Scripture says that they were talking with each other. They were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Um, we, we wring our hands over things. I, I, I wring my hands over over things that we experience through the week, that I experience through the week. And my things may not be your things, but we all have these things 
that have happened that put a wrench in between a knowing relationship, a confident relationship between us and what God's doing in the world. They were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And almost out of nowhere, even though they, they were wringing their hands over these things in their heads, out of nowhere, Jesus comes up and crashes their conversation. It's almost like I can see him coming up behind them and putting their, his, his arms on their shoulders saying, Hey guys, what are you talking about? Like, who are you? And where did you come from? I had no idea someone was eavesdropping on our conversation. There were two of us, and now there's a third party asking 21 questions. Now it seems kind of inconvenient. I think it's interesting that some of the incredible things that the Lord does in our lives look like inconveniences initially. But he crashed their conversation. He said, what are you all talking about? And they're like, have you been living under a rock? Or are you the only one in Jerusalem that, that, that doesn't know about these things? Are, are you the only one who doesn't know about these things that have taken place? About Jesus of Nazareth, who is mighty indeed, word and power, a prophet? And he said, no. What things? And so they had to tell him the story. And so they go on. You heard the scriptures. About these things we wring our hands with, these things that we're going over in our heads. We'd hoped that he would be the Messiah. Some women said that his body had been removed from the tomb. They told some idle tale about angels saying that he was risen, but they didn't see Jesus. And again, I think it's interesting that sometimes we point accusatory fingers toward other people's experiences that they have of seeing Jesus and the Lord could be in our midst, and they didn't know that they were having a conversation to Jesus about Jesus, and they didn't see Jesus. Yeah. And, and, and so they, they told him, and they said, and, and Jesus says, how foolish of you guys. And he goes on, this is what was, was a sticking point for me as I study. Um, he said, don't you all understand that the Messiah had to suffer. In other words, don't you understand that the Messiah had to undergo these things <laughs> and then enter into his glory? Don't you guys understand that the Messiah had to undergo these things and then get the glory? We try, the, the Messiah tried to warn you. It's important to point out, brothers and sisters, that the understanding and undergoing aren't mutually exclusive. We want them to be. I think oftentimes we want to understand deep things about ourselves, our life experience, our relationship with God and other people. We want to understand something outside of undergoing anything. But he said, don't you guys understand that, you had to, that the, the Messiah had to undergo? They're not mutually exclusive. They run in tandem. Sometimes our understanding is a byproduct of undergoing. And unless we undergo, we may not understand. With that, I've always had some reservation as we entertain this understanding and undergoing interplay. I've always had some reservations about why there wasn't a sudden revelation of Jesus on the journey. You? Don't you think that life would have been a lot easier had he showed up and said, hey, it's me, and then removed whatever barrier that, that caused them from not being able to see? I've always had some reservations about why there wasn't a sudden revelation of Jesus on the journey. Why drag it out? Couldn't we have dealt with a lot less drama? Can we have dealt with a lot less difficulty, a lot less discomfort? Have we discovered in the second mile what we know we would have discovered in six? I mean, it'd be a lot less messy had Jesus just dropped the disguise like an episode of The Masked Singer. <laughs> Messiah edition. It's me. And that would have been a lot less messy. To know in the second mile what they would have come to know in six, but the undergoing wouldn't have been as tedious because we would have understood, right? That's what we want. We want to understand without undergoing these things. 
But in all seriousness, why keep the suspense, Lord? Why not show us now what you know we'll see coming next in mile six? We want a magic eight ball, Messiah. <laughs> Will the diagnosis disappear or not? Will the biopsy be benign? Help me understand, right? Before I undergo, I don't want to take the next step. Will my kids turn out okay? Will I graduate and get a good grade? Will the relationship be reconciled? Because right now it's kind of messy. Will we beat the Baptist but to Bob Evans? <laughs> You're tracking. You're tracking. Thank you. Thank you. But God, give me some revelation today for the reservations I have for tomorrow. Give me some revelation now for the reservations I have next. Help me understand so I don't have to undergo. But look, and this is where God got me this week. I'm sharing it as a lesson that the Lord taught me, and perhaps it applies to you. I don't know. Let the Holy Spirit move. Could it be that one of God's greatest gifts isn't just the deliverance from Emmaus Roads, but development in? Maybe the Lord just doesn't want to deliver you out of, which is a reality. Yes, God does deliver us out of slavery, sin, death, complacency, a lot of those things. But perhaps one of the greatest gifts of God isn't just the deliverance from an Emmaus road, but a development in or on an Emmaus road. Could it be that, that in many compartments of faith, the process is the point? It's not just about starting or the destination or arriving. The process is the point. Let's, let's look back. Jesus said in so many words, did you, did you guys not understand that the Messiah had to, go, had to undergo these things before getting the glory? And then the scripture says, as they walked, as they underwent, beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus revealed all the things about himself in all the scriptures, that as they, as they underwent in walking, he used that space, that liminal in-between space to teach him something they didn't understand. And in so many words, Jesus is saying, guys, I know you want to understand what you're undergoing. I know that, but check this out, flip it. Undergoing these things is the very means by which you'll understand. Undergoing first was a necessary function to understanding my glory. You're going to know it when we sit down at the table, but in the meantime, I'm going to use your traveling as a means to teach you. And so sometimes we have to undergo some certain things as a means of understanding in ways we didn't before. And so this is what the Emmaus travelers teach us, brothers and sisters. It's that, it's that faith doesn't dissipate our reservations we do have. It's the roadway for the revelation we don't. Faith in God doesn't dissipate the, revelation, the, the res reservations that we have for tomorrow. It's not like all of a sudden proclaiming that he has risen will make the nerves go away for the anticipations that we have for the coming days or some stuff that surprise us. That's not faith's function. Faith doesn't dissipate the reservations we do have, but faith is the roadway that gives us the margin to experience the revelation we don't yet have. It's in that light, church, that I don't find myself so much praying to God for the strength to start or even the fortitude to finish, but I pray, I beseech God for the boldness to abide in between. In the in-between. Not to understand in order to undergo it, 
but to have the gumption to undergo even when I don't understand. So the day grew dark. They hadn't arrived. They weren't to Emmaus yet. They were en route. And so are we. The scripture says that as Jesus walked, he walked as if he were going on. The Lord will not do anything in our lives that we don't invite God to do. I would venture to think that he would have continued walking. But they stopped and they said, hey, look, we're not going to travel anymore. The day is dark. It's getting late. We have some reservations. Why don't you, why don't you check out, why don't you check in with us? He said, look at this. Jesus stopped when they asked him to stay. They said, they said this, they said, stay with us. Stay with us. Let me see it again. They said, stay with us. Stay with us. We have reservations, but you know what? What, tur what turned into an inconvenience we really found quite incredible as we traveled taught us some stuff. Won't you stay because there's still things we figure, we're trying to figure out. We have some reservations, but there's always room for one more. At least our Lord, our teacher taught us that before things turned upside down, before things took a turn. So come, come sit down at the table, be our guest. And so it was, Jesus sat down at the table as the guest but he took the bread, and the guest became the host. And he did something very familiar. He took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And the familiarity of the, way, of the manner in which he did it made their, their, their brains burst and their eyes open. Because I can see they turned the pages of the past. And they remember when he was on the mountaintop. And, the, and they were in a desolate place, in a dark place too. And they had no means of being able to provide for everybody. But a boy showed up with two loaves, and, or, or five, five loaves and two fish. And it was he, Jesus, who took the bread. And he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them to distribute. And their eyes were open not only because they, they received something familiar at the table but they saw the signs the scars when he broke the bread they saw the broken body and they went oh, now we understand but it was a byproduct of undergoing things so he said those familiar words and he showed the scars and then they understood because they underwent some things on the road and so they stuck with Jesus and Jesus stayed with them and so it started with some reservation rolled into an invitation to come in and that invitation gave way to a revelation at the table where their eyes were open and so church get this they left that space and they underwent the same six mile journey back to where they came from with a new understanding. They left one table and traveled back to another table with no hesitation, no reservations. Why? Because this is what they realized. Check this out. He was in our former days and we didn't know it. Because as we underwent those things on the road, he taught us to understand things about himself and all of the scriptures that predate us. He was with us in our former days. He, he is with us in our current days. And we have no reservations about him with, uh, being with us in our coming days either. He was in our past. He was with us in our present. And in ways we can't comprehend, we have no reservations about him meeting us next. That's a comfort that he is no place, that we can be no place that he hasn't been already. We saw the hands of the one who holds tomorrow he did the thing with the things that we gave him. He, he, did the, he did the thing with the things we gave him at the table. You know what? Maybe we should follow suit today. Maybe let him do his thing with the things we leave here. They take the bread with them. We do. 
Maybe we should follow suit. Let me check this out. And I close. For all those of us in between something right now, for all those in between, invite them in to say, be a part of whatever this is. Stay with me. Stay with me, Lord, because I'm not so sure I could stay with you. Stay with me. Leave some things at this table today in confidence that he has something reserved for tomorrow. For tomorrow. May it be so, brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. Amen.